Well, Happy New Year. My name is Steve Sand. I'm the director of the SOAS China Institute. For a particularly important year like 2021, when we can expect it not to be too different from 2020, at least to begin with, we are going to have a presentation and discussion on another very important year in history, a year that, that was particularly important for China. And that was, of course, the year of 19. 49, the year of revolutions, as our speaker Graham Hutchings calls it. Now, what is interesting, of course, is that in 1949, the Communist Party of China won and became the government of China. And for all intents and purposes, most people will see that as the winner. What might be an interesting question for ones to reflect on is, after 1949, who really were the winners? I think a lot of that will depend on whether we're looking at governments or we're looking at people. Ironically, the people who lost, the people who were kicked out of China and took refuge in Taiwan might not have done so badly, at least for a very long time. Now, whether you want to take a view like that, or you stick to the more authentic or uh, orthodox views that in 1949, China had its revolution, and it marked the beginning of the PLC, or as Chairman Mao would like to call it, New China. It's a matter for you to decide, but it is a subject which I think our speaker is eminently well qualified to discuss with us on the basis of his new book, which will be released by Bloomsbury later this month. And the speaker is, of course, Graham Hutchings, who is an associate at the Oxford University China Center, as well as an honorary professor at the University of Nottingham. He had previously served as the managing editor at Oxford Analytica and also as the uh, China correspondent for the Daily Telegraph. And he had spent a long time working and living in Beijing and Hong Kong. And it all, he also is the author of Modern China, a Companion to a Rising Power. With that, I'll hand over to you Graham, and then we will have discussions. Oh, sorry, uh, Graham, before I hand over, just let me remind everybody that we are recording today's seminar and um, I will try not to, uh, we will try not to reveal your identity, but when you raise questions and answers using the Q&A box, if you could include uh, some form of identification of who you are, it will enable me to moderate because I would like always to give priorities to students and I would also like to uh, involve people from different backgrounds and different locations as, as much as I can. I will not without your name if you ask your name not to be reviewed. Now, thank you. And with that, I really hand over to you, Graham. Thank you, Steve, very much for that generous introduction. And my warm thanks to, to the many people who have joined this session. It really is a pleasure to be in such distinguished company. I know that among those are a number of friends who have contributed wise advice and counsel while I've been working on the year 1949 project. And I'm not going to embarrass anybody by naming them but I do want to use this opportunity to publicly thank them for their support and for their enthusiasm. Well, I wonder if, uh, like me, although we are only 11 days into it, I'm pretty well fed up with 2021 already. If you are in that category, I have some good news for you because I am able to offer you 40 minutes or so in a different year, 
in a different place, in a different context. It would certainly be a stretch of the imagination to describe 1949 rather for the reasons that Steve earlier hinted at uh, as a happy year. It depends where you stood. It depends whose side you were on. It was certainly a tumultuous year. It was certainly a dramatic year. And it is certainly a year about which one wants to form opinions, but not, I hope, before one has considered the evidence, the events, the key episodes of that year beforehand. Please don't take it just from me uh, that 1949 was a special year. Despite appearances, I wasn't very active myself in that year, uh, 1949, and we have good authorities on whom to rely when seeking for some judgment uh, about that year. Let me, as Exhibit A, as it were, bring to your attention the remarks of Britain's assistant military attaché, who in early 1950 was asked to reflect on the year 1949 for the benefit of his masters in London. He said, as I have shown on this slide, um, ahead of the, the great gathering of October the 1st and the founding of the PRC, that 1949 will go down to posterity as a memorable year in Chinese and world history. Now, the military attaché, Lieutenant Colonel Jua Jury, to give him his full name, was a military man, uh, obviously, and he focused on the military dimensions of the year on which he was reporting. 1949 is memorable, particularly in the military sphere, he wrote. Never before has a civil war been waged with so many troops over so vast an area. Over 5 million nationalist and communist soldiers have been engaged, while the victorious armies, i.e. the communists, in many cases have finished up well over a thousand miles from where they started and have crushed all organized resistance by nationalist forces on the mainland, with the exception of a few armies scattered over West China. Those few armies were the dying embers of nationalist military and political presence on the mainland. They lasted until the early months of 1950, but not much more. He, Lieutenant Colonel Dewar Drury, was certainly correct, but he didn't tell the whole story, and perhaps that reflected the fact that he was a man in uniform, staggered, rightly so, by the dimensions of what had been going on in the field of combat. But 1949 was a, an important year for a series of other reasons. It was an inflection point in China's history. And I say that because it brought to power a revolutionary movement that was determined to uproot the country's political, social, and economic order and replace it with a new one, namely New China. It was a critical year in the history of the Soviet-led international communist movement, about which, for understandable reasons, one hears rather little these days, but which was a vital force in its time. What Mao's victory in the Civil War uh, did was to bring the Cold War firmly into Asia. It placed the world's most populous country firmly in the Soviet camp. Broadly speaking, and one has to speak in such general generalities, China, we could say, had been in the Western orbit, with the exception perhaps of the Sino-Japanese War, a big exception, ever since the opening of China, so-called, with the Opium Wars in the 1840s. That century of movement in the Western orbit came to an end in 1949. Since that year, China has never been, despite the dreams of certain Western leaders in the Western orbit, neither does it look like it ever will be. 1949, of course, was the final year, in one sense at least, of a bitter civil war that raged across swathes of the country. And this is another reason why it is so important. It tore families apart. It sundered friendships. 
It ruined millions of lives and forced hundreds of thousands into exile. For others, of course, it realized revolutionary promise, a chance at last to change China, to shake up the country and regain some of the strength which it had experienced in earlier generations. In 1949, human triumph and human tragedy existed on a colossal scale, coexisted indeed, on a heart-rending scale. If we were looking for yet further evidence of how important this year is, of course, we have the fact that it created two Chinas, both of them still with us, both of them posing a risk to the peace and development of China, but also East Asia and beyond. And so we find when we reflect on China at the present day, a country of enormous global standing, indeed a global power, that it has yet to experience what most global powers in history went through before they became great, national unification. It has yet to achieve that goal, and that is a remarkable feature of this year and the legacy that ensues from that. Civil war in China is as yet unfinished. It might drag third parties yet into a conflict that is now more than 70 years old. So those are the initial thoughts that I wanted to lay out before you as far as the worthiness of our little excursion into 1949 is concerned. And I want us to think of this year for the purpose of this exercise as a tapestry, or perhaps better as a Chinese scroll full of figures, full of action, full of dramatic scenes. And I propose to unfold that scroll in the next half an hour or so, stopping to focus on selective events and episodes to illustrate the richness, the drama, and the significance of the year. In the course of this, of course, we will come across some familiar faces and we must spend a few moments with them, but I hope also to encounter some less well-known figures and people whose experience, whether good or ill, sheds light on this particular year. We will encounter personal struggles and rivalries, privations on a truly uh, remarkable scale, and we will encounter revolutionary commitment and enthusiasm. Our first scene requires us to spend a little time with two familiar faces. These men had been, by the time of 1949, locked in mortal struggle with each other for the best part of a quarter of a century. They were people with similar traits in terms of personality and character. Iron will, discipline, though one might say Jiang Jiexu, Jiang Kai-shek, more disciplined in his personal life than Chinese communist leader Mao Zedong. But of their commitment, of their determination, of their ruthlessness, there could be little doubt. How do we find these two protagonists at the end of 1948 and 1949? What is their mood? Where are they operating? What are their primary considerations? Let's start with the President of the Republic of China. Chiang Kai-shek is 62. He is in Nanjing, the capital of his country, a city subject to a good deal of modernization in the late 20s and 1930s, a city associated very much with his name and with his regime. But at the start of 1949, it is a city engulfed in fear. It is a city full of refugees. As 1948 gave way to 1949, Chiang Kai-shek summoned his leading civilian officials to a soiree in his residence in the heart of Nanjing. There were fireworks above the premises. Uh, there was fancy food on the tables, but no one was in the mood for celebration. How could it indeed have been otherwise? 1948 was a year of colossal disasters 
for Jiang, for his allies, for his government. He had lost Manchuria, China's industrial heartland. He has almost lost North China at the beginning of 1949. The mopping up was required still on the part of PLA before the whole of North China, north of the Yangtze, was in communist hands and Jiang's centrally controlled armies were defeated. Indeed, by the time of this soiree, gunfire artillery can be heard on the north bank of the Yangtze. Jiang's wife had left in November or thereabouts on a desperate mission to get more aid from the United States. President Truman treated her with respect but gave her little more than tea and sympathy. There was no more money, there was no more munitions for the time being for Jiang's uh, cause. At this soiree, surrounded by 50 or so of his civilian colleagues, he dropped a bombshell. He had been under pressure, sometimes openly in the media, but certainly from confidants to resign, to step down, to open peace talks with the communists. He had resisted this, and anybody who knows anything at all about Chiang Kai-shek, and that includes many of you taking part in this session, are not surprised by that turn of events. Indeed, so worried and distressed by what was going on, was he, that he had reliably reported to have forsaken his Methodist discipline and taken a glass of whiskey every evening to help him sleep. He would step down. He would hand over power to Li Zongren. As for my own position, he said in a speech which deeply shocked those present, I have no concerns at all. As long as peace is secured, I will follow the will of the people. And there was a yearning for peace for understandable reasons. As far as the government of Chiang Kai-shek was concerned, there was a calculus at work. He, Jiang, was playing for time. Time to rebuild the defenses south of the Yangtze to replenish the army. Time, perhaps, he hoped, for the United States to come to the aid of his embattled regime. Time to form a coalition government if the communists would play ball, that might preserve some elements of the Guomindang regime and maybe even some position of influence for himself, if not for him personally, at least for his allies. And time, lastly, but by no means least, to transfer financial, military, and cultural assets to a safe place well into the South. He chose Taiwan, early in 1949 as the destination for those assets, though it seems to be very much a moot point whether or not he had at this stage decided that that would be the island fortress that it later became. Let us switch then from Chiang Kai-shek to the mood and the modus operandi of his great rival Mao Zedong. Mao is in his 56th year. Whereas Jiang is in the relatively modern, well-architecturally styled city of Nanjing, Mao and his comrades are in a village in the Taihang mountain range about 200 miles southwest of Beijing, as it was called then, but we'll call it Beijing for the, for the sake of convenience. We're referring to what would later become the capital uh, under Mao, as it was in imperial times. Mao and his comrades are in yellow baked mud walled cottages. Zhu De is there, the architect overall with Mao of military victory. So is Zhou Enlai, the suave diplomat, the external face of the communist the government as far as the outside world was concerned. And so is Liu Shaoqi, Mao's great organizer, a man very adept at organizing labor unions and, as he would soon prove, running cities. Mao's third or fourth wife is there, Jiang Qing. The communists 
are basing their headquarters in Shibaipur. And it's from there uh, that they are ruling something like one quarter of the country on one third of its population. They're doing so under a unified uh, North China a government that formed the prototype for what would soon be the central government. Mao said shortly after the 1949 had started that his army, the People's Liberation Army, had close to numerical superiority over the government forces. Mao's army had 3 million, Jiang's at this point 2.9 million. But Mao was though often described accurately as an impetuous man, full of revolutionary fervor, yet also tinged with caution. The war was going to end much more quickly than had earlier been anticipated. The cusp of victory was here. Complete victory was still some time off. And whereas Jiang Kai-shek in January announced to the public, the 1st of January to be precise, that he would step down, and that he would expect the communists to be sincere in negotiating peace, Mao Zedong, in his carry the revolution through to the end, castigated the nationalist leaders. They were gangs of bandits. They were venomous snakes. The Chinese people should show them no mercy. And the revolution should certainly not be abandoned halfway, because, as Mao put it, the enemy will not perish of its own accord. So here we see these two great art rivals in the struggle for mastery of control. But let's move away from Nanjing and from Shibaipur to the capitals of the world, those of the great powers in particular, and see their perspective on the struggle as it unfolds in 1949. And let's begin, first of all, uh, with the United States and the view from Washington. How might we attempt the very ambitious task of describing in a few words this complex relationship between the United States and China? Well, at this stage, I think we could do worse than use the phrase fatal attachment. The United States cause of preserving a vision, uh, a version of China was uh, almost close to complete defeat. Chiang Kai-shek was too weak to win the civil war. He was not strong enough in terms of having popularity and the legitimacy to be worth supporting, but he was too powerful, too important, I should say, to be abandoned. The Americans were in an extremely difficult position as far as their backing for this man was concerned. There were those in the State Department, many of them working in China, who argued that the United States should perhaps recognize realities and open a hand of friendship towards the communist regime. There were those indeed who said perhaps Mao will be like Tito of Yugoslavia, and we needn't worry too much about a rock solid alliance with the Soviet Union. And there were those who said, just a second, it might be possible for Chiang Kai-shek to hold on somewhere, anywhere, and we certainly shouldn't be over keen to recognize what will soon be Red China. We find a different calculus, naturally enough, at work in the Kremlin under Stalin. As far as Stalin is concerned, the progress of Mao's revolution is very gratifying. But the Soviet leader has some concerns of his own, and they're expressed here in this question that he asked of one of the interlocutors between Stalin and Mao. Mao had been asking to go to Moscow and visit a leader who he greatly admired for many months in 1948, and Stalin had always kept him at bay. They had corresponded directly and via intermediaries. Stalin's concern is that Mao is reckless. If he advances through the country too rapidly, surely 
Stalin said, he will force the Americans to come in and intervene on behalf of, of, on behalf of Jiang. And if he does that, then the Soviet Union would inevitably be involved as well. He has enough on his plate, Stalin, in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, uh, and is not at all keen on a involvement in China. The Soviet Union, nonetheless, is on the brink of welcoming a new member, a huge new member, and one whose weight in the scheme of things is such that it could tip the balance in the Cold War decisively in favor of the Soviet camp. That, again, is on the positive side of the ledger. On the other hand, to go back to Stalin's concerns about the personality of Mao, this is a revolution, though, aided by Soviet advice, Soviet money, and often Soviet weapons, nonetheless is largely made in China. Might not Mao, Stalin wonders, turn out to be a bit of a handful? Might he not want to assert leadership of his own as far as the Soviet and socialist camp is concerned? What is going on in China in 1949, in some, as far as the Soviet Union is concerned, is a mixed blessing. Let's look at it from the perspective of London before we return in country to 1949 in China. Britain is neutral as far as taking sides is concerned. It has its own desires and wishes, but it doesn't have any natural sympathy of the kind that the Americans had for uh, Chiang Kai-shek and has absolutely no interest in the advance of communism in China, still less the capture of China by communism. But it has some very important desires of its own. It has a very extensive commercial stake in the city of Shanghai that it wants to retain for as long as it can. That is why, in the words of Ernest Bevan, and in a famous memorandum uh, that uses this term as its title, Britain wanted to keep a foot in the door. This set in train a series of thoughts that culminated in the controversial decision of the United Kingdom government to recognize Mao's regime in January 1950, about which more in a moment. Key British considerations are the future of Hong Kong. And alongside that, there is absolutely no British interest in the triumph of communism in China when one considers how many overseas Chinese there were in Britain's Southeast Asia empire, particularly, of course, Singapore and Malaysia. The recognition that I referred to of London um, or by London uh, of the uh, Mao government in 1950 was the first real occasion, by the way, in which the otherwise solid alliance between Washington and London since the Second World War had some real strains. Let's return to China and to high politics in Nanjing for a moment or two. Jiang's problem is a military problem, but it's a political problem as well. It's a problem of having within his own camp people on whom he can't rely. Here we see the two main leaders of the Guangxi faction of the Guomindang. Guangxi had, since the late 1920s, charted its own course and challenged Chiang Kai-shek as uh, a fake, one might almost say, follower of Sun Yat-sen compared with their own endeavors and their own principles and reforms as implemented in their province. They produced fine fighting men. During the war against Japan, the Guangxi leaders were reconciled with Jiang in the great struggle against the foe, and they were on his side in the bitter struggle against Mao, but they were often at odds with him. In April 1948, Li Zongreng, much to the fury of Jiang Kai-shek, had been elected vice president uh, by the National Assembly. Let me just add a couple of sentences to that point, if I may, and 
uh, reflect on the fact that this was a genuine election uh, conducted by the National Assembly in Nanjing of a kind that we haven't seen in China since. Was it free of sharp practice? Uh, was it free of corruption? Almost certainly not. But was it an open contest for a key position in the Chinese state? The answer is yes. The problem Chiang Kai-shek faces now is that in stepping down, Li Zongren becomes acting president. And since Jiang's armies have suffered such an enormous defeat in North China, the most formidable forces are those under the control of Bai Chongxi. They are sitting in the mid Yangtze region, a few miles north of the embankment, but in depth and strength uh, on the south side of the river around the city of Wuhan. Jiang finds himself precariously, dangerously in the hands of people with whom he has been at odds for decades. And his great anxiety is that the Guangxi leaders, very keen to open peace talks with the communists, might strike a deal that suits them and not Chiang Kai-shek. That is not an enviable position for Jiang and the future of the Kuomintang government to be in. And yet, moving from high politics to the battlefield, the Guangxi leaders themselves and Bai Chongxi in particular weren't in the greatest of positions. Bai's great antagonist in the civil war, and indeed uh, beforehand, was the man shown on the left of him in this slide, Lin Biao. Bai Chongxi has about 300,000 troops at his disposal, the best of them his own Guangxi troops. Lin Biao is in charge of the fourth field army, which has close to a million troops. It is better prepared, it is better supplied, it is better led than Bai's forces. And for the last few months, it has been doing nothing but advance where Bai has been retreating. Lin, he's 41, 42 at this stage. He's self-assured, he's affable on the surface, but in fact, rather nervous and highly strung. He's a man who has de dedicated his entire life to the revolution, showing much more interest in politics when he was at school than academic study. A com committed communist by the time uh, he was 18, he played an important role in almost every stage of the party's march to power uh, and beyond. Bai Chongxi is a good deal older. He's 56 to 57. He is no less committed to his cause. In fact, Bai Chongxi, as little more than a teenager, marches out of his hometown in 1911, the time of the rebellion against the Qing dynasty, uh, to join uh, the youth army. His father pleads with him outside the city gates at Guilin to uh, desist and to stay at home, but he pays him no attention, marches on and begins a military career uh, that may places him amongst the very best of Jiang's generals. Lin Biao, Bai Chongxi, they have met in a bloody encounter before 1949. In 1946, their forces were ranged against each other for uh, the Battle of Manchuria at Serping Jie, a junction, key railway junction on the borders of what is now Liaoning and Jilin provinces. This was a hard fought campaign and Lin Biao's forces were forced out uh, by Bai and um, they were uh, pursued uh, very quickly. Bai was then Minister of Defense and wanted to capitalize by moving north and seek to destroy Lin Biao's armies, but Jiang was under pressure from the United States to impose a ceasefire. Bai Chongxi's son tells us that this was a lost opportunity that his father regretted to the end of his life. Well, Lin extracted terrible revenge on Bai Chongxi during the course of 1949. They are, at the beginning of the year, up until April, facing off against each other in the central China-Wuhan uh, 
area. Uh, but within a matter of weeks, Lin is forcing by ever further south. At the end of the year, the last we see of Bai Chongxi is that his headquarters of the Central China Command are located in the former Catholic Church in Haikou, the capital of Hainan Island. His army is cut to pieces in Guangxi, his reputation badly damaged, his political career ended. He moved to Taipei in early 1950. He died there a saddened, diminished man in 1966, whereas Lin, as of course is well known, went on from strength to strength and great things in the PRC until he died in very controversial circumstances, the plane crash in Mongolia of 1991. We ought to move away from these uh, diplomatic players, from these key figures, uh, the political elite and the military elite in this contest, and spend a little time at our next scene with the sorrow of war. War has a sorrow of its own, as we all know, and civil war is that most beastly and ghastly form of war of all. The American national who was head of the China Maritimes Customs had an entry in his diary which I found striking. You can see it at the bottom of this slide. It is, I suppose, something with an element of truth in it, but with armies bearing down, with the fear of communism on the part of some, sitting alongside the enthusiasm, admittedly, for it on the part of the others, what could the Chinese people do but flee? What could they do but flee to protect their families and such few assets as they could take with them? Moreover, uh, the author of these particular remarks uh, um, was himself on the move constantly. He worked for Jiang's government and he fled from Shanghai to Guangzhou at the time he was writing his diary and he fled from Guangzhou ultimately to Hong Kong. So I suppose he had some personal experience of what he was writing about. On this matter of personal experience, let me just shared a couple of stories with you about two individuals that gives us some idea of the torment and the tumult and the sadness of leaving, of departure, of moving away from one's family and one's um, home county or village, in some cases, many indeed, never to see it again. The lady on the left of this picture uh, left her village uh, at the age of 24. The village was Chunan in Zhejiang. Her husband was a uh, military policeman with uh, Chiang Kai-shek's army, and she felt she had to leave. Strapped on her back as she walked out of her village in January 1949 was her firstborn, Ying Yang. She told her mother that she would be back soon, but she never turned to look at her as she walked out of the village on the start of what was a 15 month journey backwards and forwards across China. She headed first for Changzhou where her husband uh, was serving. She took a crowded train, perhaps of the kind that you can see illustrated in this picture. She did so against the background of the roads being clogged, the trains being full, and the ships and boats that were used to travel around South China in particular, being close to capsizing because they were uh, full of so many soldiers and passengers. Mei Jun made it down to Guangzhou, but not before she had left Yingyang with her mother-in-law in a remote village in Hunan. She was in Guangzhou for a few months and saw the war coming yet closer to the city refugees pouring in in their hundreds and their thousands. She could not bear the thought of leaving Yingyang there anymore. And so she managed to get a train to go north from Guangzhou up to the Hengyang region of, of, of uh, Hunan again, very much against the flow of traffic. 
uh, the uh, track had in places been blown up and she and others had to walk along the side of the track. She described to her daughter a heartrending scene when having linked up again with her yin yang uh, and decided to get the train back south found it was absolutely crowded and uh, on her mother-in-law's advice decided that she would have to leave the baby there after all. The person she was with uh, seized the occasion to thrust Mei Jun on the train as if she was a piece of freight, as she described it in her recollection. By March 1950, Mei Jun is in Hainan, where Bai Chongxi had been, um, and she in common with many hundreds and thousands of others was trying to evacuate. She recalled the scene as people tried to embark on the few boats that had been allocated for the transfer of civilian and military personnel to Taiwan. People pulled themselves up ladders to get over ship's rails and into the boats like so many spiders, she said. Many couldn't make it and fell into the water. Cries of help went up but few paid any attention. Cotton shoes bobbed up and down in the harbor. Wounded soldiers who had protected the retreat lay on the dockside, crying in pain. Those on board the ships, of whom she was one, could only look back helplessly, abandoning them to their fate. She arrived eventually in Kaohsiung in southern Taiwan some 15, mark, some 15 months after she had set out. My second little scene, as far as this theme of fear and flight is concerned, is that dealing with the experience of the man who later became, and is still, a well-known poet uh, in Taiwan, Ya Xian, or Wang Qinglin. He hailed from Henan, uh, a schoolboy there. Uh, the war came to Henan, the southern part of the province in particular, uh, in the autumn of 1948. His parents um, and the teachers decided they couldn't let the children in this province, in the city of Nanyang in particular, but also elsewhere in the province, be subjected to the risk uh, that was unfolding. They would have to be on the move. So the teachers gathered the students or school children together, uh, told them to prepare what they could and to march south in search of safety, that they would try and educate them on the way. We students, recalled Xia Yan, recalled uh, uh, Ya Xian, didn't really understand what was going on. It seemed like fun at the time. His mother baked some bing or cakes for him to take on the journey and accompanied him until the group reached the outside of the city walls where they lived. Ya Xian, again, did not look back at his mother but simply kept walking. At the time, I had no idea what goodbye meant. My grandmother also came to see me off, but I didn't acknowledge him. That was the last contact I ever had with my family. Later in the year, Ya Xian is in Yongzhou, in Hunan, on the Xiang River. Uh, he is with hundreds of other students in a temple complex where their teachers are still trying to educate them. And it's there that he sees posted on the walls an appeal for young men to join a new army being raised in Taiwan, being raised by the rather able uh, Taiwan general Sun Li Ren. I call him a Taiwan general because he escaped there and made his later career there. He had, of course, built a very successful career in the war uh, against Japan on the mainland. Uh, ya Xian and a few of his other chums decide to break away from the students that they're with and to move down to Guangzhou. In August 1949, he and his pals uh, embark on a boat and end up serving in the Nationalist Communication Corps as very young recruits. We must now return to the battlefield to uh, understand something of a key uh, turn of events in 1949. And that is the crossing of the Yangtze, which you can see depicted here on this map. 
Mao Zedong had determined to cross the Yangtze irrespective of the outcome of the peace talks. These began fittingly enough, so said those of a sarcastic disposition on April the 1st, and they concluded on April the 20th in Beijing without any results. The delegation from the Chiang Kai-shek government was treated in a way in which other uh, parties involved in negotiating with the Chinese communists would come to experience. When they left Nanjing, it was with high hopes they were given a terrific send-off from the nationalist-held airport in the capital city. When they arrived in Beijing, there was hardly anyone there to greet them. A few jeeps and trucks turned up and ferried them to one of the capital, or as it would soon become, finest hotels. They were there, it was made plain by their communist hosts, to negotiate a surrender, not to negotiate a peace fire. It was three weeks of a rather depressing experience as far as those nationalist delegates are concerned, but a triumphant one for Mao. The crossing of the Yangtze was an extraordinary accomplishment in terms of logistics, requiring sailors, requiring vessels uh, on a very, uh, a very large order. Uh, it was said to the American ambassador Leighton Stewart that the Yangtze was such a formidable banner, barrier, for an army moving north to south, that it was worth 300,000 soldiers. Well, I'm afraid that is testimony to the weakness of the nationalist defense. Within 48 hours, not much more, of midnight April the 20th, something like half a million, three quarters of a million PLA troops had crossed the Yangtze and pushed more than 100 miles south. The crossing began in the area I'm illustrating with my cursor here, in the Wuhu area, with the aim of moving as far west, I beg your pardon, east as possible and cutting off Nanjing from which uh, further retreat would be expected. Time magazine, which is a good record of reportage as far as key aspects of the civil war in China is concerned, told its worldwide readers shortly after the crossing of a stunning swift disaster. Nearly a million communist troops along a 400 mile front poured across the broad Yangtze. Nationalist China's last great defensive barrier swept the government positions aside like puny earthworks in a raging tide. The communists moved with impressive speed, in four days, they took Nanjing and cut off Shanghai and captured a dozen strategic nationalist cities. Of course, the army was only one part of a one-two punch as far as this aspect of the communist campaign was concerned. Soldiers could accomplish much. They could topple the government, but they couldn't run it. Those charged with running the new government were the southbound cadres, the Nansha Gambu. These were men and women, mostly young, recruited in those areas where the communists had been established for some years and recruited moreover from universities where many young people rallied to the cause of new China. Their task was to move in behind the army, to take over urban management, to move out into the countryside when circumstances allowed and undertake and extend that work which had done so much to cement peasant support for Mao Zedong and to keep for the largely peasant ranks of the PLA a loyalty to the communist cause. When they put their guns down and returned home, they would have land. No such promise was made to the Guomindang armies of Zhang Jiexue. Taking the cities is worth a moment or two of our time as we move towards the final stages of this journey through 1949. The list of the cities that fell in that year uh, is not ex ex exclusive, uh, um, but it gives you a flavor 
of the size of them. And it enables us to make a number of observations about this key phase in the year we're looking at. Remember that the communists until 1949 had hardly run any cities. This was a rural insurrection in which famously the peasants surrounded the cities. From late 1948, perhaps the autumn, right through 1949, we see a conscious, organized propaganda, an educative campaign launched by the communists saying, we have to change our modus operandi. We are moving into the cities. We have to run them well. We have to change from rural insurrection to urban management. If we fail in running the cities well, then we will not be able to hang on to them. What is remarkable about the cities and their fall is that in no major city was there a civilian uprising against the ruling Nationalist Party and in favor of the communists. Certainly there was a communist underground, often quite extensive in the case of Shanghai, working for what they called liberation. But the masses of people were not demanding a changeover, a turnover, though they were certainly hoping for much better administration than they'd got from Jiang Kai-shek's regime. There were skirmishes uh, in the suburbs of Shanghai. And the picture on the right of your screen is of a poor soldier involved in the great exodus of Jiang's troops from the Wusong Forts area of Shanghai in May 1949. But the skirmishes were in the suburbs, and with the exception of Shanghai, uh, they were not uh, particularly protracted or bloody, with one exception, and that was Taiyuan, the capital city of Shanxi. Here, the fighting lasted months, or the siege did, and the fighting was exceptionally bloody. And here, uh, the extraordinary thing was uh, that Taiyuan, though firmly, as it were, in the nationalist camp, was not a city directly controlled by Jiang Kai-shek and the central government armies, but rather by Yan Shishan, uh, accused by his critics, he wouldn't use the term himself, of being a warlord. And I think for the purposes of this exercise, we can uh, let him keep that epithet. Um, but someone who retained a deep loyalty amongst the people he had been ruling in that part of China for a long time to come. You can imagine, of course, uh, familiar as I'm sure you are with the commercial importance of Shanghai, uh, that the advance of communism and the communist armies on that remarkable city caused a great deal of anxiety in the business community. We might just spend a moment or two with Liu Hongshan, who was one of the city's uh, big hitters as far as the commercial side of the city uh, was concerned. He had very early on been interested in a move to Taiwan. He knew Jiang was building that up. He sent uh, a couple of his sons there uh, to explore the area uh, and to uh, make some investments. But he also saw close at hand the chaos that had arisen through the Guomindang's mismanagement of the economy, the inflation, uh, the issue of a new currency, and the compulsory exchange of gold and other assets into that new currency. Taiwan is not going to be the place for us, Liu Hongsheng told his business associates. He then moved to Hong Kong. He spent six months there whilst the communists moved in Shanghai. He took assets with him uh, and he built up business there. His family, once the communists had taken over the city in May 1949, besieged him to return. Things were not as bad as he feared. There was business to be done in that city, certainly more than in Hong Kong, which in commercial terms was uh, but a shadow of Shanghai at that time. What seems to have tipped the balance as far as Liu Hongsheng is concerned is not so much his family or appeals from his wife, or indeed from his mistress, all of which were strong and doubtless heartfelt. But it was Zhou Enlai who reached out 
to Liu Hongshang and said he would be safe if he returned. He could do business if he returned. He would be patriotic if he returned. And so Liu Hongshang did. Arrangements were made for a clandestine departure from Hong Kong to avoid interference by nationalist agents. On the 2nd of November, he boarded a steamer bound for Tianjin. He had an audience with Zhou Enlai, and in January, he was back in Shanghai, a supporter in public of the new regime, but a man who three or four years later may have come to regret it since his extensive companies uh, and enterprises were nationalized and um, the old world, as far as he was concerned, was a thing of the past. Let's just reflect momentarily on this new world that Mao had created and that remarkable gathering uh, on the 1st of October 1949. This was the first large scale public outing for Mao Zedong. The press were rather small in number. Uh, the Soviet camp had a number of media representatives there, as did one or two East Europeans. But it was certainly a public occasion. And as with all public occasions since, there is a great need on the part of the Communist Party to ensure that spontaneity is kept under control and that enthusiasm is marshaled. So one of those uh, recorded uh, the pleasure as a young man of being in the crowd, in the audience for the 1st of October um, celebrations to commemorate the founding of the PRC, but having had to be there by 5 a.m., being given the appropriate slogans and uh, to shout and placards to carry. But let's not dwell too much on the theater, but focus just momentarily on the substance. China acquired what I call the furniture of its politics uh, in 1949, the People's Democratic Dictatorship, a term which if one is to be pernickety about it, seems uh, illogical, but is very much uh, of a piece with the way in which the party looks at things, because the party determines who the people are, and to them vouchsafes democracy. Those who are not the people, who curiously enough are those who oppose the party or have certain views about it, are subject to dictatorship. What we see also beginning in 1949 is popular participation and mobilization on a hitherto unprecedented scale. Never have so many Chinese people gone to so many meetings as was the case beginning with the foundation of the PRC. The attempt, the concern, the urgency, the desire was to reshape minds, to reshape mentalities. This was the year also, this was the moment, to be more precise, when Mao announced that China would shift global allegiance. It would lean to one side. It would lean to the Soviet camp. It would be the time when the institutions and the language were put in place that had dominated the life institutional and political of China ever since. There's been reforms. There's been changes in nomenclature and other measures, but the essentials were laid down uh, in this period, a period of genuine enthusiasm, but also of acute psychological pressure to conform. Penultimately, in our odyssey in 1949, I want to spend a moment or two in the periphery, notably in Hong Kong. You do not have to be very familiar with the sources to imagine that what was going on on the mainland was a matter of great concern to the governor of Hong Kong, the government of Hong Kong, and of course, uh, the government in London. London was neutral, but London was very interested. Throughout 1949, the colony had been on edge. There were a number of comforting signs coming from communist sources that the PLA would stop at the frontier. But once the PLA had crossed the Yangtze, or more particularly, 
whilst they were doing so, something occurred which made London very alarmed indeed. And I'm referring here to the HMS Amethyst, the sloop um, uh, of the Royal Navy uh, that was fired upon, uh, if you believe the British account, by PLA guns because it had strayed into the war zone. This was a humiliation of the kind that the British seem uniquely skilled at serving up uh, at delicious moments in certain uh, combat. Uh, in Hong Kong, the humiliation, the loss of life of UK sailors put a different complexion on things. And the government under Ackley was determined to show that the PLA would have to pay a heavy price if they wanted to move across the frontier into Hong Kong and take back what after all had been a matter of shame as far as the Chinese were concerned in losing the territory a uh, hundred years earlier. For a period uh, in 1949, uh, there were military almost everywhere, British military. Uh, a carrier fleet was readied, uh, aircraft were sent in, artillery and tanks were uh, sent to the colony. You couldn't quite describe, describe it as an armed camp, but you could certainly describe it as on a serious defense footing. But that was only one strand of what was going on here. This territory, ill-prepared, under-resourced, few assets to its name, was inundated with refugees. Not so much military, although there were soldiers there who dropped their uniforms uh, on entry into the colony or shortly after. Uh, but they were there on a massive scale. And the British were genuinely worried whether the communists would stop when they got to the frontier. We know that they did, uh, but we did not, when we consider a year like this, ought to assume that those who lived through it had the advantage of our hindsight and our knowledge. And here we see a rather striking contrast between a PLA irregular meeting what I assume is a British national in customary Royal Hong Kong police shorts at the frontier that divides what was then just communist China and Hong Kong. And we well know uh, that Hong Kong retained its status as a British colony, that the relationship between the new masters in Beijing, now the capital, and Hong Kong was testy, uh, was problematic, uh, but it survived. It wasn't much improved by Britain's recognition of the PRC in January, but a modus vivendi was established that lasted despite the changes of policy over the years on the mainland, right through until 1997, essentially, in which Hong Kong changed hands, of course, and indeed for about 20 years beyond that, until very recently when China decided it would take Hong Kong in hand. And so in this journey from north to south, um, in which we've sought to illuminate various aspects of this year and the conflict at the heart of it, we end up here in Taiwan. Taipei, the capital, was declared the capital of the Republic of China and the seat of Jiang's government on December the 9th. He had been hoping to hold out in southwest China, but it proved impossible to do so. The military forces ranged against him were far superior, were much better led, and there was no public support for his regime of the kind that would give him any kind of base. And so he moved, as we know, to Taiwan. It had only a matter of months prior to this been a sleepy, relatively underpopulated place. Over the course of 1949, it had become a military camp. It be had become the repository of many of China's cultural treasures. It had become the custodian of most of its foreign exchange uh, and gold and silver holdings. But could it be expected to survive? 
could it be expected to be a last redoubt for very long? Not very many people thought so, despite the fact that 100 miles of ocean separated the mainland from uh, the island and the Chinese PLA had got across the Yangtze, but getting across this stretch of water was a completely different category of amphibious warfare. We know, of course, that what saved Jiang Kai-shek, what saved the Republic of China, was nothing that happened really in 1949, but rather the adventurism of the middle of 1950, when the Civil War, or rather the uh, Korean War, uh, began and Mao Zedong moved troops across the border once it looked as though the North Korean regime was in difficulty. The Americans moved in creating that defense parameter and perimeter that you'll see shown in the map there. And so began the long durée of China's civil war. And so continues the long shadow of 1949 in China. An unfinished civil war, perhaps the world's longest running civil war. One that hasn't seen an exchange of shots uh, in anger in recent times, mercifully, but which seems to be edging closer. The shadow of 1949 is lengthening. It is deepening. And it is something, if we're to understand, I submit we need to be familiar, more familiar than perhaps often we are about the great drama of 1949. I'm going to stop there. Thank you for your attention and return us not only to Steve, but to the, the uh, year 2021. Well, thank you very much. Graham, for this fantastic personalistic uh, the, to the force of what happened with 1949. We already have a, uh, about four or five questions from the Q&A box. Let me just remind everybody that if you would like to ask a question and you are using the uh, Zoom platform, please write your questions in the Q&A box and if you would like your name not to be mentioned, please say so, but it will be helpful to give me some background about yourself. And if you're using the um, Facebook feed, then please put, put your question in and Aki will transfer this to the chat box and I will pick that up as well. Before I go to the uh, question from the audience, can I start by asking you, Graham, a question about the military side of 1949. Because you start off telling us about the balance of military power, at least in numeric terms, at the beginning of 1949. And then in your overall outline, it was quite clear that given the physical size of China, after the main battles in Manchuria and uh, North China, namely in the Beijing tension area, as well as in the uh, uh, Shandong uh, Xuzhou area were finished. It was really a matter of as far as the People's Liberation Army could march. By the beginning of 1949, with Manchuria where the best of Chiang Kai-shek's forces were, being lost. And it was clear that Beijing and Tianjin could not be held and it was just a matter of what would then happen happens to the enormous force under, under Fu Zhuoyi's command in Beijing. And when that go, when that went, was it not already clear that the PLA in fact had overwhelming military advantage? And given that it was a victory in the civil war, it really was just a matter of how long it would take for them to uh, get hold of the mainland of China or indeed the hold of China. I mean, what's your sense of whether it would be appropriate to see that as primarily a military victory 
or whether it was a revolutionary victory. Thank you for that very pertinent question. There are a couple of things to say about this. One is that there's quite a lot of testimony from the time that very much supports the view that Jiang's fences had been broken and that recovery was impossible. There also, however, are the views, not least of those of Jiang and others, not to a man or to a woman, but nonetheless there, that a fight could still be made in 1949, importantly, not to recover lost ground, not to get Beijing, Tianjin, North China, still less Manchuria back, but to put a powerful argument forward at the negotiating table that would allow Jiang and the ROC to survive in some form. Now, that could be a north-south split, hardly desirable from Jiang's point of view, and certainly not from Mao's point of view, but a possibility. Also, that the United States might yet come in in some significant way, because although one must re remember that the battlefield victories were sweeping as far as the PLA was concerned, there is a pic bigger picture going on in the global campaign of the Cold War and uh, a recognition that despite the fact, for example, shortly uh, before 1949, if my memory is correct, the Berlin blockade crisis was ended. Nonetheless, um, there was still a great deal of tension around the Civil War, and it might be uh, that the United States decided that we cannot actually let China completely go over to the communists. So we have the prescient view, we have the hindsight view, we also have the view that something can be done, not to recover, but to hold on somewhere. And to your other point about a military victory, I think it's been well established that the Civil War was a war not so much of ideas, not so much of policy, though land reform and a new China counted for much, but a war of huge armies, often mechanized, um, often involving uh, artillery and uh, pitched battles that gave the mainland to the communists. Let's move on to the questions that we have received. Um, the first question I would like to put to you is from Rory McLeod, who asked you, um, who ask you about this. Uh, Stephen Colkind is now working on the final volume of his Life of Stalin. He has argued that Stalin has no deep uh, support for Mao and that the United States could have persuaded Stalin to drop logical support for Mao. Recall that it was, was not until May 1949 that the Soviet Union acquired its nuclear deterrence. Did the United States miss a trick? Would withdrawal of Soviet support have made a big difference to the outcome in China? That's a, 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 a very intriguing question. I'd like, um, and I do so with some trepidation since I know the originator of this question, just to point out that I think it was actually August 1949 that the Soviet acquired its nuclear uh, deterrence, but that's a minor point. I think Kotkin has written um, and spoken, interestingly, on this topic. The opportunity that the Americans had, if they had one, was much earlier than in 1949. It was then far too late. Had shortly after the Allied victory in the Second World War, such an appeal been made to Stalin and some provision granted to him such that his interests in Manchuria and access to the Pacific uh, could be guaranteed. He might have been willing, it occurs to me, to um, not drop, but at least 
not be so vested in Mao's victory over the entire country. Right. The next question I would like to pick is a question from a China scholar based in Germany. His question is, how come Dutch China scholar Frank Dakota claims that the story of the liberations that followed 1949 was actually first and foremost a history of calculated terror and systematic violence? How can a professional researcher make such a bold statement isn't it misleading serious students of Chinese history? I think that's a question that might be better put to Dr. Dakota rather than me. Uh, it's not my job to defend an argument that I haven't made, at least on this occasion. However, having said that, and myself being a fairly close student of Frank Dakota's work, I think he's referring to the consequences of what we touched on when we were making our journey together through 1949 about campaigns, about changing mentalities, about mobilizing uh, the population, which, as we've said, had a good degree of enthusiasm and voluntary participation in it, but also had a good deal of coercion in it. And in a revolution, by definition, one might say, there are going to be the suppressed. And therefore, I suppose that the Dr. Dakota has the suppressed in mind when he used the descriptions attributed to him by the questioner. Okay, um, next questions come from Barbara Gregor Taylor. Do you feel, as I do, that China would have fragmented further and never be united under Chiang Kai-shek had the nationalists prevailed over the PLA? One of those questions that is uh, the occasion for all sorts of interesting excursions and hopefully insightful uh, discussion. We know, don't we, from a consideration of his performance and role during the time that he was in China and president of the country, that there were huge parts uh, of sovereign China and leaving aside the issue of Xinjiang and Tibet, whether you think that's China or not, they'd certainly be in the, um, uh, the areas outside his control uh, where he wasn't able to wield the country in a way in which the communists did as a unified force. However, I would say this, I suppose, that because the communists did it, and I think I'm right in saying, though as I've mentioned in connection with Dr. Frank de Cotter, I don't want to argue uh, and pretend I'm somebody else. Um, uh, I'm not Chinese, but I know like many of us, have many Chinese friends who are very satisfied uh, and pleased at what they regard as China's national unification. Um, though we've said uh, the story of 1949 is that na national unification is not complete and that 1949, I don't want to regard as quite a decisive year. I want to regard it as a critical year because the communists have unified China other than Taiwan uh, in the way that they have doesn't mean that there weren't other ways of doing it that we might say were, broadly speaking, more participatory, more consultative, and perhaps involved less in the way of the military component. Next question from Ruben Barucha. I have heard it said by a historian of China that the entire period from 1911 to 1976 can be characterized as one of constant revolutions. 
to me, this would lessen the impact of the events of 1949. Would you like to, would you agree with this characterization or would you like to comment on the revolutionary elements of 1949? Thank you for that question. And it is one that I've thought about. I think there are a number of other contenders apart from 1949 for a year of singular importance in Chinese history. 1911 might well be one of them. Um, the completion of the Northern Expedition and the unification such as it was of China under Chiang Kai-shek in 1927-28 might be another. And then moving into the communist period, uh, the cultural revolution, perhaps the great leap forward before it might also be contenders. You will, however, forgive me if I remain partial to 1949 for uh, the reasons that I tried to explain. And just briefly, the fact that it created the state that we still have and laid down patterns of institutional, cultural, political behavior that remain evident, more than evident, dominant in the China of today, despite the vicissitudes that have occurred between 1949. And if you have a little bit of doubt about that, this is not a clinching argument, but is worth a moment's thought. The present government in China regards 1949 as the creation myth. Every state has one, we're told by the political and social scientists. It is the creation myth of contemporary China, that moment when power was seized, when China changed in a way that is fundamental uh, and in a way that cannot be challenged. Those other revolutions, particularly those that have occurred since 1949, be it the Great Leap Forward, be the Cultural Revolution, have been challenged often by the Chinese Communist Party itself and indeed uh, renounced. So I think, though you won't be surprised to hear me say it, the case for 1949 is strong, but I'm not saying it's the only important year by any manner of means. Okay, the next question comes from a um, Chinese person, uh, Ray Hong Song. Li Zhongren and Bai Shunxi were never members of Chiang Kai-shek's camp. They had been challenging his power since all the way back to the establishment of the Nationalist Party. Their struggle weakened Jiang's regime and accelerated its collapse. And then ultimate partition of the Guangxi clique between Li Zhongren and Bai Shunxi became the determinating factor of their failure in politics. What is the reason for these internal partitions within the Nationalist Party, which were never settled, becoming such a severe problem that they could not stop even in the last days of the regime on China? The questioner has put his finger on a fundamental matter, a perplexing matter, and I'm very grateful that uh, that's the case. I, I can't give, of course, in the space uh, allocated to me a comprehensive answer, and indeed I don't have one. Um, what I can say, and it goes back to one of the earlier questions about national reunification, or rather the lack of it. Um, we are dealing in Jiang's era in the Republic of China an extraordinarily strong sense of provincial identity. Each province had its leaders, had its characteristics, still does of course, but they were woven into the fabric of Chinese society in a way that was not the case after 1949. Indeed, one of the reasons, one might say the sole biggest reason for the communist success was their 
eradication of provincial identity. You'll recall what I referred to the Nanxia Gambu, the southern Harders who spread out all over China and ran provinces. So Guangxi, for example, after it was liberated, if you take the pro-communist view, or it fell to the communists, if you take the nationalist view, was run very largely by the four field army generals who came from Manchuria. There was room for some Guangxi people in running the province after 1949, but they were determined that the distinct sense of identity and separation and basis for rivalry had to be eradicated. Now, I think Bai Chongxi and Li Zongren knew that their number was up. When it came down to it, at the very last minute, their power depended on Jiang Kai-shek, and they had to side with him, but by then it was too late. There was no room for them in uh, the new communist policy. They were fiercely anti-communist because they weren't ideologically um, uh, well disposed towards Marxism, uh, but they knew that in the new national state, there was going to be no room for people of their stamp and their independent power base. So there is the uh, abbreviated answer to a very uh, complicated and profound question. Thank you. This will have to be the last question and I'm pack packaged two into one. It started off with um, Gregory Leslie asking you whether the British recognition of the PRC was an act of real politic or a combination of real politic with a concern to avoid antagonizing Mao because of the fate of Hong Kong was hanging in the balance. And this is supplemented by a question by Melia, how one of these, our students, PhD students, asking you whether you believe that the UK's policy towards China in 1949 would have been different if there had been a different prime minister in the UK, i.e. Cameron Attlee was not prime minister. Thank you for those two interesting questions. With regard to the first, uh, certainly a desire to protect very considerable financial and commercial assets in Shanghai was an important factor in recognizing um, the new government in Beijing. And the hope also that it would allow some uh, conversations to take place and some cooperation, if you like, even if only um, to blunt potential antagonism on the part of the government towards Hong Kong. Britain wanted to preserve. Remember uh, that um, Britain is weak, Britain is poor uh, at this juncture, and yet Britain is determined to hang on if it can. I think that goes to the second uh, question about the Labour government elected in 1945. The Labour government, as you'd expect of people of that political stamp, was anti-imperialist, but it rather liked the empire. That was an important part of Britain's post-war prestige, and it was a matter that the Americans were taking interest in in the context of the global Cold War. It was an asset in the battle against communism. Whether the recognition of the PRC was uh, a success is something I'm a little bit hesitant uh, to answer, not least because um, Steve has addressed this matter in his uh, published work now over several years. Uh, it didn't achieve uh, anything much uh, at all in the way of protecting British assets in Shanghai. And the Chinese communists, in a very early but important display of their determination to rub the British noses in it, insisted, despite recognition on the 6th of January, that from then for the next three or four years, recognition was only about establishing formal 
diplomatic relations. The charge d'affaires appointed to the new government in Beijing was a negotiating agent. He, and it was a he, wasn't a diplomat in the true sense of the world. And there would be many Chinese at the time, and I think since, who would draw a great deal of pleasure uh, from seeing Britain haughty, proud, uh, once important in China, cut down to size so dramatically. Thank you very much, Graham. I'm afraid that I have been again defeated by the clock. I have to draw this to a close with apologies to at least a dozen people who have raised very good questions on the Q&A box. I simply cannot fit them all in. I merely try to spread out as many different aspects of the questions that I could gather. And with that, if we could all thank Graham Hutchings, and then I hope to see some of you again next week. Thank you very much, Graham. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.